Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. If you want to turn your Bibles to Psalm 19, we're going to be in Psalm 19, a Psalm of David, King David. And I'm going to answer a really basic question today. What is the Bible? And then how does it fit into our worldview and how the Bible is the basis for our biblical worldview, obviously, because it's the Bible and we want to have a biblical worldview. And uh, I just want to let you know, I am very grateful for my, my eyeglasses. I am very, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful for corrective lenses because if I take them off right now, uh, I'm, I'm nearsighted, but right now you all look very blurry. And my daughter says I look very tired when I don't wear them. And I want to tell her it's because of her, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, and I've been told that people prefer that I wear my glasses. And uh, so they, they, if I don't wear them, I can't tell who you are. And my whole view of life is completely distorted without uh, my lenses on without my glasses. They correct it. They correct what I see and they help me see you. I could pick you out from a crowd. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I, I can't drive without glasses for my safety and your safety. <laughs> and so if you ever see me driving in public without my glasses on, uh, I want you to run and drive the other direction. No, I'm just joking. I'm probably wearing contacts probably wearing contacts if you see that. Uh, I inherited this imperfection you know, through genetics, and I'm not getting on my mom and dad for that. It's not their fault either. It's something that's out of my control. We inherited an imperfection called sin, and sin has caused us to have a distorted view on life and ourselves, the world, and even God. And so what the Bible does is the Bible serves as corrective lenses on humanity. The Bible helps us see God and know him and know Jesus in salvation and, and know how to live a holy life. Uh, the Bible is pivotal to our livelihood, to be honest with you, especially as Christians. And I thank God for the Bible because what it does is it's the revelation of God that corrects us, that corrects assumptions or ideas and tells us what is true and then teaches us how we should live. And so that is the importance of the word of God. And today I wanna to share with you how the Bible is God's chosen instrument to reveal himself. And the Bible is also the framework and lens that forms our biblical worldview. So I have a lot to cover in a short amount of time, so bear with me. We're gonna be in Psalm 19. 1 through 14. And this is what it says, starting with verse 1. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun it bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows it, of course, to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. David is sharing here a beautiful explanation of creation and what he sees. Anyone see the harvest moon recently? About a week and a half ago, it was gorgeous, a big orange moon over the horizon, and I was in all of it, and I, it was interesting. I, we were, my wife and I were walking, and we were stopping to look at it, and so were other people. People were amazed in our neighborhood of this harvest moon. There was this awe for this created uh, 
sun, this, this star, this ability to shine light in a beautiful manner, and, and then they have the, the moon that reflects the sun, and it was just gorgeous to see, and we were in awe, and that's what David's like here. David is in awe of the creator of the universe, and this is what we, uh, we would call general revelation in theology class. This is God revealing himself through natural revelation, through creation. And I'm going to get into that in a moment. But then David turns his attention to the words of God, the Old Testament scriptures, the law, the commandments of God. And this, now he's, he's admiring creation and how beautiful it is and how the skies proclaim God. But then he goes to the written word and he says how beautiful they are. And this is what it says in verse 7. The instructions of the, of the Lord are perfect. The word of God is perfect. Say perfect. perfect. It's without error. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right. They're not wrong. They're right. Bringing what? Bringing joy to the heart. The word of God brings joy to your heart, especially when you obey the word of God. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. How many, how many want insight and wisdom on how to live in this world? Especially nowadays, right? Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. They're not false, they're true. Each one is fair. They are, now this is, this is a, a high praise for the word of God, the scriptures, they are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. A great reward to obey the scriptures and obey God's word. And then, so he, he talks about creation, the, the general revelation of God. Then he talks about the written revelation of God or what we call special revelation, God revealing himself through the word. And what does it do? His admiration of creation and the word invokes this check, this self-examination that he needs to live a life that is pleasing to God. And this is what he says. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? So he's, he's admiring the might and the, and the holiness of God and it's making him think of his sin and how, you know, is he even worthy? Is there things in me I need to go? He says, cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. So even the sins he doesn't realize he's doing to the sins he knows he's doing, he wants to be free of it. He doesn't want to do it. He's saying, cleanse me. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I'll be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. And lastly, it says this, a beautiful verse. This is worship right here. And I pray that this would be our prayer as well. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So not just your words, not just my words, but will my thoughts and my heart be pleasing to this holy, mighty, creative God who's given us his word that's sweeter than, than honey and, and greater than the finest gold. I, I'm in all of God, and so therefore, I want to live my life accordingly to this great God because he loves me. What a beautiful scripture. And in this scripture, we have two revelations, or some people call it two books, uh, of revelation, the, the, the book of creation, the revelation of creation, which we call in theology class general or natural revelation. And then we have the scriptures, which refer to God's special revelation or uh, specific revelation. And God reveals himself through the Bible and through creation. And so first of all, general revelation has to do with all of creation. And I want to read to you the scripture we read last week. Romans 1.20, for ever since the world was created 
People have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. So all of creation, even yourself, once again, is how God is revealing himself to the world. Secondly, another uh, example of general or natural uh, revelation is morals or our innate ability to know right and wrong. There is morals in our world that people live by. There are uh, standards of right and wrong that people live by. Even if they don't have the Bible, there is morality. Have you heard, have, do you know that, right? We know that. And you've heard people make the argument, well, I don't have to be a Christian to live a good life. Well, that's true. There is morals out there. Naturally, we all know that we probably shouldn't kill people, right? We shouldn't steal, we shouldn't hurt. Even when out without the written revelation or special revelation of God, people know that that's wrong where they live and they know that there's justice and fairness. Where did that come from? It came from God. It came from natural revelation. And, and just to prove it to you in Romans 2, 14, this is what Paul says to the Gentiles who are not Jews. He said, even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God through Jesus Christ will judge everyone's secret life. So in general revelation, without the Bible, there is an existence of God but God wanted you and I to know who he is so much that he gave us the next portion, which is the special revelation or the written and living word. Written being scripture in the Bible, okay? Scripture and the Bible and Jesus Christ himself, the living word. But what happens is, is the written word and Jesus affirm general revelation. Let me explain that. When people get the Bible for the first time in remote villages and someone teaches it to them, they have aha moments, especially when they read Genesis chapter one and it says, in the beginning, God created. All of a sudden they're like, oh, so there, there was this being, there is this being that created everything. Yeah, so the Bible affirms what they always thought or wondered and people tend to worship the sun and other things but what they're really trying to do is worship God and they don't know that God is the one that created everything. So what am I saying here? Generally, people believe there is a creator, but once we show them the word, we show them that it's God who created. Now, not everyone believes that. Scientists are arguing that and all that. But in our world today, general revelation has come first for most people and then the written special revelation of God's word affirms or confirms what they've thought. Okay, and so we need both revelations. And so let's get into, and by the way, scripture also affirms where morality comes from. <laughs> it comes from God. So did you sign up for theology class today? I hope you're okay. We're good. We have a very smart church here and we're growing and we're learning. And this is like theology one-on-one. And uh, special revelation is the written word and the living word, Jesus Christ. Uh, we believe that the Bible is infallible, means it's incapable of error, and authoritative word of God. We believe the Bible is incapable of error because God himself is the author of scripture, okay, and God would not lie or deceive, and that he has, and he has given us an authoritative word. There are some really good books out there. There are some really good authors and writers, but there's no book like the book that God has written there's no book like the words of God that can change entire communities and is endued with power. The Bible is active and living, Hebrews 4.12 says. It's alive and it's working as you read it and the Holy Spirit works with it. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, and I'm gonna cover some other scriptures next week. All scripture is God-breathed or inspired. It's breathed out by God and, he, and is useful for teaching or the KJV, King James Version says doctrine. So the Bible gives us doctrine and teaching. It rebukes us. It, it will say that that's wrong. 
and then it also corrects us. It doesn't just say it's wrong, it tells you how to get back on the right track. Praise the Lord for that, right? And then lastly, it trains you in righteousness. Why? It trains you to live a righteous life so that, every, or so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's talk about God breathe, all right? Let's talk about inspiration. When Paul speaks of all scripture is inspired, he's referring for sure to the Old Testament. But when we look at the New Testament, we see that Paul confirms Luke's writing by calling it scripture. So Paul himself later on calls Luke's scripture, scripture, Luke's writing scripture. And then Peter says that Paul's writings are scripture. Therefore, not just making the Old Testament scripture and inspired by God, but making the New Testament inspired by God. That God used his apostles to write down what they witnessed, but he was guiding them along in the process through who? The Holy Spirit. Because he said that he would send the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them and teach them in all truth. The disciples found that they were writing, what they were writing was guided by the Holy Spirit. The apostles and Paul were guided by the Holy Spirit to record and write down the events that they saw and the teachings that they have. And they all believed that it was from God, not from human origin. So that's the key difference is most books are are authored by man, but the Bible believes, and we believe, and the Bible teaches that it's authored by God. And it's spoken and, and breathed through his Holy Spirit. Now, why did God use man? Well, God used mankind from the beginning. God told Adam and Eve to rule and reign and to take care of the fish and the animals and all those things and to name them. So God has always been using mankind to do his will on earth but he gives us the agent of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us to do that. That is, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's consistent in scripture. It's what we always teach. And, and people will fight that and argue that and people debate that. And I look forward to giving you some really solid evidence starting next week um, after I set up this foundation. I wanna give you solid evidence of how much this has been criticized, but yet it has not been refuted that God it really is the author of all the books of the Bible. So we praise God for that. We believe the Bible is inerrant. It's without error. Infallible means incapable of error. It's reliable, it's faithful, it's trustworthy. So you can trust. And again, why? Because God does not lie according to scripture. The unity of scripture has baffled many scholars and historians, uh, Christian and unchristian, because there's this amazing unity that goes throughout the 66 books. So we're answering the question, what is the Bible? Well, the word Bible means book, believe it or not. In Latin and Greek, it means book. But within the Bible is 66 books. And what they have found that over the span of 1500 plus years, there are 40 different writers on three different continents in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, three different continents, 40 different writers over a span of 1,500 years, okay? Different backgrounds, such as shepherds who are the writers, kings, scholars, fishermen, prophets, military general, a cupbearer, doctor, and a priest. Such a diverse uh, authorship, so to say, or writer, or, or the ones who pen scripture, these writers penned narratives, history, laws, poetry, prophecy, proverbs, and prison letters, like Paul. And where? Well, palaces, prisons, the wilderness, and places of exile, not even in their homes. Meanwhile, here's what scholars have found. Meanwhile, they all have this amazing harmony and unity in events, recorded events in history, as well as this one message that God is gonna redeem all creation. Now, just to help you understand how complicated that would be, is 1,500 years to the Pentateuch, let's say, okay, and Moses in authoring and writing, or writing the Pentateuch, okay, and God guiding him through the Holy Spirit, and 1,500 years later, okay, or Prophets, Old Testament prophets 
who prophesied events are going to take place in the New Testament. Um, just so you know, Google and email did not exist. Did you know that, young people? Uh, in order to communicate, say, hey, there's a prophecy here that says Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. We need to get this message to uh, Matthew and Luke and others that they need to make sure they put this in the scriptures, but not only put it in the scriptures, but also make sure Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem, okay? Um, can someone send that email? Uh, or, or at least let's put it on papyrus and this leafy thing and, and write, hey, just a quick editor's note. Um, some, someone needs to read this and make sure Jesus uh, in Mary's womb knows to at least influence her mom. To, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like how did they communicate to fulfill 300 prophecies about Jesus? They didn't. What took place is God is the author of the Holy Scriptures. God is the author and the fulfiller of Scripture. And so God was d divinely organizing and divinely doing his work and speaking through people. And because of that, we have an amazing unified message in 66 books that make up one book, the Bible. Praise the Lord. I mean, you can search that online and you will find just so many points to make about that. Uh, it's incredible, the unity in scripture, yet the diversity of how it all came to be. And there's this one message of God's redemptive work and how he's gonna restore all of creation through Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. God didn't just give us, though, the written revelation of, of his word. And by the way, uh, oral tradition is not very reliable. So God was, he's genius and all knowing. He says, let's, let's write these things down. So he prompted these people to write these things down. Not just what to say, but the idea of recording all of this, even though that's a tradition that every nation would do back then, whether they're pagan or Christian. But he wrote this down because oral tradition, you could forget things and say the wrong things. Everyone ever do the telephone game? You say one thing on this end of people, and by the time it gets to the 10th person, it's completely distorted. So we have reliable scripture, reliable text to help us know that by the time it got to us, it's still consistent, and I look forward to giving you evidence of that as well next week. So the written word's powerful, but what about this? What if, what if God himself came down to earth? That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? So he also sent us in his special revelation, the living word. John 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Who's the word there? The word is Jesus. The living word. John 1 is a beautiful scripture to read about this. And it's amazing that, that, that God would send us up front what scripture actually looks like, you know? Like a, the living word. And this is what it says in John 1.14. So the word became human and made his home among us, the incarnate God, Jesus. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Now, when I've read Hebrews, I've read over this so many times, I've, I've missed this. And when I was reading this for my devotions, my personal Bible reading time, I was in the book of Hebrews for the past two weeks, this is what I read. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. Wow. So the prophets, they were, they were for a certain time. Uh, I would argue that John the Baptist was very prophetic and a prophet. And there's still prophets in the New Testament and there's still prophets today. But when it comes to scripture, uh, Jesus himself came to speak God's word to us. And it goes on to say this, uh, God promised everything to the son as an inheritance and through the son he created the universe. Sounds like Psalm 19. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. Sounds like Psalm 19 at the end. 
where, where David wants to be holy and sinless because God is holy and perfect and does not sin. So here in Jesus, we have everything we need to know about God. I was thinking about this as well in a kind of an illustration for us today. Any of you live in New York City growing up or Brooklyn, Queens? All my neighbors are moving from Queens, Brooklyn, yeah. Uh, there's not very good views of stars out there, is there? It's kind of hard to see over the skyscrapers and the pollution and the billboard signs and all the signs, and it's hard to see. And I thought about that. That artificial light keeps us from seeing the beautiful skies and the stars and, this, and all, the moon and other things. Like, things get in the way. You know, that's what it's like, too, spiritually. We can be so in this world we can be so, you know, we're, we're in this world and it's dark at times and you're still not able to see the stars or you're still not able to see God or the things, the world is so shiny and bright that it distracts you from seeing God all around you. And sometimes you got to get away from the artificial light so you can see the stars. Sometimes you need to go into that, that place alone to see God, to see his creation. Sometimes we got to get out of this world. We all should get out of this world. We should be separated. We should be holy and different so that we can see God, okay? Like, like literally, physically, in my neighborhood, in order for me to see stars, I have to sometimes put my hands up in front of the artificial light or go somewhere else where it's darker so I can see. We live in a world where we have to sometimes get away from all the craziness in order to connect with God. You know what I'm saying? Let me tell you how amazing God is, though. Jesus is God coming to you wherever you are. Whether it's in a really bad place in a worldly way, sinful, dark, wicked, or whether you're out somewhere and you're by yourself and it's just you and God and you're not surrounded by wickedness in a culture that is hurting you and, and causing you to walk away from God. What I'm trying to say is, is God came up close and found you and revealed himself to you. Do you understand that? Like fathom that, just think about that for a second. Reflect on that. God knew that you wouldn't be able to see him as well because this world and the wickedness is doing what? Suppressing the truth. Romans 1.18, we read it last week. So he sent his son Jesus to come into the world so you could see God. That's special, that's special revelation. And by the way, I know that you and I weren't there 2,000 years ago, but Jesus really did walk this earth and do miracles and die on the cross and rose again. And those are, that's the kind of evidence I'm bringing coming up here in the next couple of weeks, okay? This is what we know to be true. And the very small minority of, of skeptics out there believe Jesus didn't exist. It's foolish for people to say that. It's foolish. Everyone knows Jesus lived. What they argue, though, is whether Jesus was divine and a miracle worker, and was he from God or not, okay? What Jesus himself says who he is. Now, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one shall come to the Father except through me. Uh, Josh McDowell says this, either Jesus was lying, he's crazy, or he's telling the truth. Here's the thing, though. Jesus doesn't lie because he's sinless, he's perfect, and everything he said so far has come true. And then there's no sign that he was crazy. Everyone believes, and when your psychologists and historians study his life, they don't see any craziness. So they've concluded that Jesus must be telling the truth. And he was willing to die for that truth. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Praise the Lord. So lastly, the Bible is the frame and lens for our biblical worldview. Okay, let me give you a definition of what a worldview is. And there's a lot of good definitions out there, but I'll give you a, one of my favorites that I saw was, was from Oregon State University. And these notes are online, calvarydover.org. Click on growth articles. You'll see our, my sermon notes on there. Um, Oregon State University said, a worldview is the set of beliefs about fundamental aspects of reality that ground and influence 
all of one's perceiving, thinking, knowing, and doing. In other words, a worldview is, is a set of beliefs and a, a, a narrative or a story and assumptions or convictions on how you view all of life and everything. It's usually found in culture. Certain cultures have different worldviews on things. So like subcultures can create a worldview on different things. Now, a biblical worldview is really inserting the Bible in the middle of all that. A biblical worldview is an overarching view of the world based on God's revealed truth, which is the Bible, which directs our life in this world. A biblical worldview shapes our beliefs about God, creation, humanity, moral order, and purpose. So in a nutshell, and by the way, that was from Biblical Worldview Institute, in a nutshell, the Bible is our trusted and reliable framework by which we view God, ourselves, and our world, and how we ought to live in it. So if I wanna know who God is, and I wanna know what kind of beliefs I'm supposed to have, if I wanna know who I am, and how I'm supposed to live, and why am I here, where am I going, what am I doing, I don't go to an outside revelation or outside source uh, that doesn't know who I am, doesn't cre didn't create me, I go to the one who created me, okay? I don't wanna use naturalism or scientific worldview. I don't wanna use postmodern worldview. I wanna use God's view of me. And then God's view of the creation that he created. Imagine asking someone, like a scientist, what they think God was trying to do here. When we don't have all the answers from God and we have to settle for that. By the way, that's what I love about science. Science and Christian faith actually work together well if we get rid of all the skepticism in it. Uh, science helps confirm God as the creator. And we need Christian scientists. Students, just to know if you're studying. <laughs> God is the God of science. Amen. What we have is scientists trying to figure out why we're here and how we're here and how we got here but they don't want to acknowledge that it was God as the source of how we're here. Remember, in the beginning, God created, right? It doesn't say in the beginning, God was created by something creating things. It says in the beginning, God was already there creating everything else. That's what it's trying to say. All right, and so God created scientists. Praise the Lord. Praying for them. So, we can, know how, we can know how we're supposed to live and everything because of the Bible. So let me, let me, I'm gonna show you some statistics. Um, a biblical worldview, can, there's like 54 questions in this recent research. Um, and let me give you a couple examples. Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? That would be one of the questions. Do you believe that mankind has sinned and need a savior? Do you believe that there is absolute truth and God is absolute truth? These are the kind of questions that are being asked to church members and pastors. And the recent research uh, from Cultural Research Center at uh, Arizona Christian University is pretty alarming. Let me show you where pastors stand on a biblical worldview and show you this slide. This is in America. The percentage of Christian pastors that possess a biblical worldview, all together, all Christian pastors, only 37% hold a biblical worldview. So many of them are answering, so the other 63% are basically saying no to those questions I just asked you. Jesus isn't divine, mankind isn't really sin, sinners, they, they don't need a savior. There isn't just absolute truth, there's subjective truth, there's moral relativism, there's whatever your truth is, is my truth, my truth, you, you know, I can have truth, whatever your truth is, is up to you. They're saying no to those things. They're, so we, at Calvary, we fit in the 37%. We believe in a biblical worldview, okay? Here's a, here's a big one. When, they, when pastors are surveyed, 
Um, how do you get saved? Is it by grace through faith or by works? Pastors are saying, well, it's a little bit of both. No, it's by grace through faith. It's the grace of the cross of Christ and then we believe in what Christ has done for us. It's not by works. It's, you don't earn it, you don't work for it. Okay, there's uh, other teachings out there right now that there's no hell, only heaven. God doesn't exist, but yet there's Satanism and there's people practicing Satanism, right? There's these, th this is, these are beliefs, okay? Uh, so this has creeped into the church. But what's scary is it's in the leadership of the church. So if this is the statistics, uh, statistics of, of, of pastors, you know, what is the, gonna be the outcome and the product of the church people in the pews? Because this is on the pulpit. So now if, if the pulpit thinks this way, then the pews are gonna think this way. That's alarming. This should bother you. I don't, I don't wanna end on a bad note today or a depressing note, but this should be concerning. Okay, um, let me show you real quick too that children's and youth pastor, only 12% hold to a biblical worldview. They're the ones raising your kids. Well, not yours because our, our pastors believe in a biblical worldview. Yeah. Praise God, yes. <laughs> so your kids are safe with Pastor John and Pastor Brandon, just so you know. That's a big concern though, because we want to raise the next generation. So what's happening uh, instead, we want to raise the next generation to hold on to truth, okay? No matter how much pressure society says, that's wrong, that's evil, you're unloving, you're a bigot, you're a hater. Well, we, we love God and we want to be faithful to what God says and we're going to love you in the process. I know you're going to disagree with me, but I don't hate you. I love you enough to hold on to the truth. Um, what, what is the option then? What's the other 63% of pastors holding to? Uh, it's what's called syncretism. Let me define that for you. It's the blending of ideas and applications from a variety of holistic worldviews into a unique but inconsistent combination that represents their personal preferences. So pastors are basically taking uh, bits and pieces of different worldviews, okay, even different religions, and going... Yeah, that looks good. I'll teach that. Whereas Pastor Ryan, I get my source of knowledge and wisdom and sermons from the Bible. Okay? Simple as that. And, and this, is, this is what the leader, lead researcher, uh, George Barna, said. Uh, this is and so true. He said, this is further evidence that the culture is influencing the American church much more than the Christian church is influencing the culture. And, you know, we have to understand that we do live in this world, so we're constantly being bombarded with other world views, okay? I pray for your kids in schools. I pray for you at work. I, it's, you're constantly bombarded. But we're also choosing to, by some of the things we watch in, in online and social media, your students, your kids are watching so much stuff in social media on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. There's so many uh, TikTok theologians out there that think they know what they're talking about and have distorted scripture and uh, it's bad. And what's happening is your kids are, read, are, are watching these things and, um, and maybe sometimes you have and it begins to make you question some of the things you've always believed. But the thing is, is their, their sources are unreliable. And I'm gonna show you starting next week how reliable our sources are. So this, there's gonna be this combatant like view constantly trying to force its way in to your kids' minds and hearts and you as well. I've had parents say, Ryan, I'm starting to question things. That's why we're doing this series. That's why we're bringing back uh, getting back to the foundation of what is a biblical worldview on a variety of topics that are going on in our world. And I want to encourage you to keep coming, keep inviting people to come in here. Uh, let me share with you this scripture to close here. Uh, I have a couple of things I want to say to be, to be transparent. I know I say I'm closing and I don't close like 10 minutes later. 
I know, guilty. I read this scripture the same day that I saw these statistics. Psalm 12, one. Oh Lord, for the godly are fast disappearing. The faithful have vanished from the earth. Yeah, we gotta stop that. Like we gotta, we gotta preserve the remnant. We gotta keep that from happening. And Calvary is committed to doing that from nursery to kids to youth to young adults to adults. Calvary is committed to doing that. The reason why I use Psalm 19, because you're probably, man, that's so obscure. Why'd you use Psalm 19 for such a message as this? Because I wanted you to see what a biblical worldview looked like. David believed God was a creator. David believed that, that scripture is worth more than gold. And David believed he's supposed to be in a holy relationship with God. Those are three topics that are discussed in biblical worldview surveys. God's creator, his word is absolute truth, and we are to live a holy life in our lifestyle. David had a biblical worldview. He knew God, he knew his scripture, and he knew his role in life. He knew he was supposed to worship and live for him. I can't imagine life without God's word, can you? Think about this for a moment. Without the Bible, we wouldn't know anything about God. We could see, in, we could see him in creation, but we would be able to know it was God that says in the beginning, God created. What if we didn't have the Bible? What if we didn't have the Bible? We wouldn't know Jesus. We wouldn't know salvation. We wouldn't know how to live for him. We wouldn't know the way to heaven. Wow. I think sometimes we take for granted how important the Bible is. I'm praying today that you realize this, this Bible, hold on to it. Hold on to truth. It's a lifeline for you and for your kids and your neighbors and all those you're loving on. They need the truth of God's word. They need a biblical worldview. Amen. Let's stand together and pray. I'm going to pray for our offering too. And just thank you for your giving as just so you know, we give by giving on the way out with our ushers or online. Um, thank you for serving. Thank you for getting involved in groups and inviting people to church. Keep doing that. So, uh, so grateful. And I want you to know that we have a, a Bible class called Fundamentals of, of the Bible starting next Sunday at the nine o'clock service that our teacher, Sten Daniels, I, I call him professor because he's a professor. He's going to do like a survey of the whole Bible and help us understand it. And I'll be at the nine o'clock, uh, during the nine o'clock service time in the education center. So that is available. There's space is limited, obviously. But I uh, want to encourage you to go through that series as we're going through this series. So God, we thank you so much for your word. It's reliable. It's without error. It's trustworthy. God, I pray that you would help us to hold on to truth, hold on to your word, and let it be the frame and lens by which we see everything. God, we thank you for your truth. It has loved us. Even the painful things it says, it's out of love for us. It's out of love for our eternal destiny. And you called us to do some hard things. And you called us to be faithful to you when the world is not faithful. When the world's coming against us, you called us to be faithful and you will be with us until the very end of the age, your word says. God, we hold on to the truth of your word, of Jesus Christ, of you. And God, we commit ourselves to allow this to determine what we believe, how we think and how we live. And Lord, let, let us be unapologetic of passing this down to our family and our friends because we care about their eternal destiny. Lord, be with us. Thank you for the giving. Thank you for the serving, the volunteering, the inviting. And Lord, thank you for a church that reaches the lost and loves the lost. Be with us as we go, as we shine in this dark world. In Jesus' name, amen.